Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, including the stuff from Brilliant Stars, make sure you go ahead and check out the Poe Town store. You can get a 5% discount on your order using that code Omnipoke. For today's video, we are going to be looking at the top 8 deck lists from two regional championships and one special event. Uh, this was in Indianapolis, uh, Joinville, as well as Bilbao. So, uh, at the moment, Limitless has uh, the Brazilian and the American regional results, but we don't yet have the good old Bilbao stuff. But I've been trawling through Twitter thanks to Pokestats, so we will be uh, looking at everything today all in one place. Let's start off with Indy, I think, as the largest tournament. Over a thousand players. Insane for a regional, honestly. And uh, long may it continue. Hopefully stuff like this is a great indicator for Pokemon that uh, we need more space for all of our players for regionals. And uh, hopefully uh, the big old issue of actually being able to reg for these big events is going to be a thing of the past. But yes, fantastic to see that regionals now... Um, are hitting over a thousand players. I think it's happened maybe once or twice before, but yeah, insane. Not sure if this is the record breaker for a regional, but only, I only really remember like NAIC having like two flights or anything like that. But maybe we could start seeing some bigger American regionals doing something similar. And it was taken down by Ian Robb. It's a name you may recognize uh, from earlier on in, uh, what was it, Salt Lake City, uh, where he played Arceus Inteleon Toolbox. And he's come back and done well with Arceus Inteleon Toolbox. Uh, so it's still proving that he is exceptional with the deck and uh, understands it perfectly, but also that um, he is... Let's uh, make this smaller, actually, so I'm not covering up half the Pokemon. That would be good, huh? Um... He is exceptional with the deck, no doubt, but also uh, the deck is still like very valid and very strong. Let's go for something like that. Yeah. Uh, this takes up the full page because there's just so many one-offs going on. That will be a feature of today. But yeah, slightly tweaked from his previous top four list. Did he get top four or top eight? I can't remember. Uh, but regardless, did very well with it and has made some changes. Added in Medicham V. Uh, which I think is a really interesting include. Obviously works with double turbo energy as well as energy switch and Raihan to get the yoga loop play off. It's playing quick shooting and just two scoop up nets. So you have to be really cautious and careful about how you make this happen. But do be aware that it is a play that you can go for. Uh, even with the Zigzagoon quick shoot as well, you can certainly target down Dunsparce. You can target down potentially even Manaphy if you wanted to just to buy that turn. Uh, you can do it on, obviously, Sobble's floating around lots of players' boards. So, very cool that you can buy that turn. If you're able to do it against Dunsparce, it unlocks the Zapdos to be a big threat, as, of course, as well, uh, where the opponent can't really react to it. So, it's a great way to yoink some prizes here and there. You've got some key type coverages. Like, obviously, in the early games, you're looking like a dark arc, and people may not be expecting the Moltres fighting energy as well. In those instances, obviously, Zapdos is very good. Um, or you just force the opponent to play on the side of caution and put down that Dunsparce and hurt their board state. So it's kind of like a win-win that you have that Zapdos in there. Hooper V was a big knee-jerk just because of um, Urshifu, and it acts as an additional Dark-type Pokemon if you really want to. It can get powered up in a turn with E-Switch plays alongside Raihan if you're doing like Malevolent Charge or if you're even doing Dire Flame Wings. You can get the Hooper out of nowhere if you want to. So it's not all in on Trinity Nova. So pretty cool as an instant response. So Ian's not playing Dunce. He's not playing Sharon's Care. He's still trying to just be type coverage, beat sticking here and there. So it's not like defensive Arc Intel, really. This is the more offensive approach uh, with lots of combo potential. But yeah, approving its worth once again. I was trying this on stream just today. I was struggling with the deck because there's a lot to manage and there's a lot of different avenues you can take so it really does take someone with a lot of experience to do well with a deck like that i think so props to them isaiah back in the top eight again making it all the way to the finals this time has gone off the urshifu train to go back to arceus in teleon this time with a beedrill package uh, which is pretty interesting persisting very good in arc mirror in the early game very good against mew as well of course being an annoying one prize check at times or just a way that you can beat stick out a v max all in one hit so dangerous into two of the top decks in the format it is playing dunce and manaphy uh, that's your sort of soft answers i guess you could say 
to Urshifu, but not really committing anything like the Hoop of E or Dark Energy, just sticking to mostly Grass, and then just has the one Water Energy, um, so that you can use Aqua Bullet if you really want to. Um, not playing Quick Shooting, uh, just trying to go for, mostly use these one prizes as attacking threats when needed. Bear in mind, the Grass Typing of Jet Spear is actually good against Hoop of E randomly here and there as well, uh, so something to bear in mind there. But yeah, just really trying to force more one prizes out in this uh, Arceus deck. It has the Sharon Pal Pad for the defensive plays. Um, it's got a decent amount of disruption going on with the Marnies. Not much else really to say about that. It's it's really just like a straightforward arc shell. I do like the high ball search count for quick four, uh, sorry, three ultra and four Arceus V just to get these established early uh, is definitely a priority. And of course, the big discards help towards getting a mustard plate off in the first place. So yeah, um, it's more or less a straight arc intel, but has just made a few concessions to make space for the B drill. You'll see that it's not playing path, for example, it's using the B as an alternative line uh, to win the matchup. So I actually think this is actually a pretty fair deck. I just think that Isaiah is like a busted player. A B drill at times can be very strong, but your opponent does have opportunities to play around it. So we'll see how B drill progresses in the format, but I think it's really only a soft answer in mirror and it, it's kind of good against Mew, uh, but it's all about timing it really. Estrada coming back and getting a big result as well with a catcher build of Mew. Very spicy. Um, it's one of those things where this deck can sometimes just completely flatten the opponent on a head slip of a catcher alongside some of the other pressure. So just embracing the fact that you can Grinch people immediately if you get a good turn one, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, they are not playing many Rotom Phones, so they really are leaning into Kramomatics working out for them to get themselves rolling. Um, but outside of that, seems pretty reasonable. Just one Rose Tower as well, so very greedy on the early game cards, actually. But he's playing double Court, double Psychic, so can be very good into Duraladon, and very, very respecting of Whimsicott, uh, so should be rolling those pretty happily. I think more people were expecting to play, like, one Psychic, one Court, but going two and two really is saying, let's not get wrecked by those. And I'm sure it would have helped out with the amount of Beedrill around as well, which is uh, actually a kind of interesting call. So it could be a way to go at least back to double purple energy um, because there's potential for Beedrill now, and this is a great way to play around it. So uh, that's interesting. If you want to embrace the catches, you can. It's not for me personally, but it can really just detonate people. <laughs> it can really wreck board states that otherwise they're not expecting... You know, there's many occasion where people get that. Let's just go back to this. People feel comfortable if they go first and get double one prizer established and they think that they can like win a race later on down the line. Uh, but this just completely puts a spanner in those works, especially with the um, with the echoing horn as well. Andrew coming in with the dark arc intel. Uh, this is... More defensive, I would say, because it has the double Sharon's and Palpad. It's also got the Avery for disruption, but it is play, uh, playing the Malafi Dunce Hooper that I guess most people would be expecting. It's got quick shooting in here, complements the uh, Malevolent Charge really nicely. Got your five basic dark, you've got the one water, the one extra capture, just with that little bit of extra safety net in the opening turns. Kind of taking a leaf out of um, Gustavo's book by having the one Clara and the Retrieval, which I think is very solid with uh, Malt, especially because Trinity Nova is naturally pulling all these energies out of the deck. Typically, uh, you're relying on these retrievals to get it all back alongside the courts. Just one stadium bounce for path. It's interesting that many of the Arceus have gone away from like a path prey approach against Mew. Uh, and it's really just like Whimsicott's the main path deck in the game at this point. So yeah, an interesting sort of twist in, in where the meta's gone right now. But yeah, a dark package for Mew. Arc Intel, just doing Arc Intel things in the mirror match seems seems okay to me. You have that little bit of extra heal, uh, so sometimes that's just enough. So, yeah, again, keeping people honest with Arceus is uh, the name of the game. We have the return of Michael Long, controversial to some, but is playing the same list as Estrada, uh, so really showing that the heads flip on catcher is such a big flip that um, it's is just worthwhile playing potentially. So I wonder if these catchers will come back in a big way. Obviously very good in Mew Mirrors uh, at times and obviously exceptional if you just hit one turn one, uh, you can really wreck a ton of board states and your opponent is really left in bits at times. 
Pablo Meza, man, this top eight is actually stacked thinking about it. Uh, is playing the water build of Arc Intel. I think it's what he played at EUIC to a pretty good finish, and he's doing it once again here. Not sure how many changes he made to his EUIC 16. Maybe just things like Manaphy came in uh, from the previous list. But again, just double Sharon's Care, Power Pad, sticking to the slow and steady approach. Has the acceleration inbuilt from the Melanie, as well as the Raihan. Um, and yeah, just seems like consistent and strong. Um, not too much really to say. It's got the rod in here rather than like um, the Clara. The upside of rod is that it helps you get sort of late game Trinity Novas as well because you can just put waters back in and Nova the energy straight back out. But of course it also acts as a card that can recover Manaphy uh, if need be or if you've had an awkward like research in the mid game to get rid of some of your Intel pieces or whatever. Uh, it can give you some prizing coverage if Arceus are hiding, that sort of thing. So, yeah, pretty solid. Still sticking to Marnie Path. I think many people have gone, a gone away from the judge route, uh, which is interesting. Uh, so we'll see how that develops. But, yeah, um, still has that path disruption available, which is cool. We have Francis playing uh, the Arc Intel Dark Package again. This one also incorporating the Zap Fighting Energy. So a little bit adapted to the one that we saw previously. This one's choosing not to play Dunsparce, but it's a thin line of the Arceus. So it again is sort of that toolboxy thing that we saw from Ian, um, where you just got that thin arc and you've got your Dark Chaps and the Zapdos. So really toolboxy, uh, focused on just a few key attackers. It's got the E switch plays you can make with Malevolent Charge uh, to get uh, Arceus out of nowhere. It's actually not playing Raihan, which is really interesting. I would say Raihan typically would just be a common place card in these sorts of decks, but it's not the case here. Um, so kind of leaning more into the Moltres, I guess, for the most part. It's got a Mew, just like we saw with the Urshifu Inteleon builds at EUIC, to just help cherry pick some extra ball search, and I don't think that's a bad thing at all, because I always am struggling with Arceus and its opening turn, so just having an extra dig in those openings ain't a bad thing at all, so... Pretty spicy here that we're seeing more Dark Arc, but with a little Zap Boot package in there as well. Kind of cool. Then we have Joseph Perez playing Mew once again. This is more traditional, where you're not going to see the catches. You're just going to see the quad phone uh, coming in. So this is basically cookie cutter Mew. This is like everyone's idea of Mew is basically the 60. And man, uh, yeah, just showing that it's bust, basically. Like, really awesome job to do cookie cutter Mew. The only thing that's sort of out there is it's a 3-3 three, three Mew line. Uh, but other than that, it's like absolute cookie cutter. But it does the job. So just play well with Mew and it's still going to do well. That's that's awesome to see, honestly. Uh, so yeah, really interesting results. Catcher Mew being a thing to worry about. A lot of these Arcus decks, well, Pablo's and Andrew's are just like kind of consistent lists. And uh, Bradner's are like consistent no thrills. But then we've got the crazy toolboxy ones here as well. So just bear those things in mind uh, that both can perform well. Let's move on to the second tournament then. And it was won by yet another take on Arceus. This is a different way to have different type coverages. We've seen the basic approach really of... Hooper V, Moltres, Baby Molt, and Zapdos. Now we're seeing the sort of stage one approach, still with the Hooper V to help against Urshifu, but you've got the Lucario V-Star and the Crobat V-Max, as well as the Barrel Engine, so leaning into draw rather than um, tutoring. And uh, like we saw early on in Salt Lake with the 4-2 line of Arceus, makes a lot of sense when you have Bibarrel, so you don't, don't draw into random extras here and there. The Lucario is a really interesting one. I've played around with it a bit. It feels like a lot of the time you do need to star buff, but if ever you're able to get through the game and are able to aura star, it's obviously very good against Arceus, even against Dunsparce. Uh, you can still one hit KO them quite easily. So that's something to bear in mind. And just the fact that it's large, it's 270 hit points. Uh, even if you're like carrying on with that two shot exchange, uh, it can still work out for you and forces, again, that Dunsparce to constantly be in play. Uh, I'm kind of surprised to see this Lucario without, like, an Avery or something like that to try and make opponents' board states that little bit weaker. Um, but, yeah, uh, I need to test out the Lucario more. I haven't really tried it alongside Arceus enough to know how it feels. Mostly I've tried Ar uh, sorry, Lucario away from Arceus, knowing that most Arceus decks just have to star buff to get anything going in the first place. And I think a lot of Lucario's strength is in its own V-Star power. So that's an interesting one. Uh, the deck plays a number of one-prize Pokemon and Crobat VMAX, making it very good against Mali. 
and obviously can be good against Mew, especially with the high path count, uh, to try and stick that, power up the Crobat, you've got the big charm that you can try and put on it as well, or put on to the Arceus, either way, it forces the opponent to spend their tablets to actually get over the line there, so, yeah, pretty interesting, you've got all the important one-offs here, nice to see, uh, yeah, it's really the Lucario that's the biggest, like, question mark of, is this worth it, because we've seen Crobat the Barrel arc do, like, well previously, so that's the real question mark, is this enough, or could it be put in different ways to deal with like mirror match situations because the one thing that's like bad about Arceus builds with Bibarel rather than Inteleon is that you can't choose to get Sharon when you want because you don't have any tutor for it uh so you have to try and navigate the mirror in a different way and I guess the different way in this case is the Lucario um so I'll have to try it out more myself but yeah awesome to see uh Lucario V-Star going all the way Mew made finals, a Mew without Oricorio, interesting. Uh, Oricorio is somewhat good for Mirror and somewhat good for Mali, but if you don't expect those, it's a free space for you, which is kind of good. It's also interesting against um, the Hooper Maltz decks, right? Because now you can't protect your Meloetta from a Hooper hit, so... Uh, I think the Oricorio is still strong enough, but hey-ho. It's playing double Echoing Horn... Uh, pretty aggressive in that regard. I feel like Echoing Horn is one of the weaker cards. Whoa, four choice belt. I've only just noticed. Four is so high. Crazy. Let's not miss our damage, I guess. Wow. I mean, it makes me think more and more about Silene from the next set, and I know that Silene is going to be good for extra damage mod. Wow, four choice belt. That really is a statement, huh? That really is just saying, I don't want to miss my damage. I Like, it's really saying that it wants to, if it's getting KOs aggressively on, like, Arceus, it's not having to spend tablets in order to do it. It's really saying the belt lets him preserve tablets a lot more. Uh, and that's uh, something I can sort of get behind so that you actually have enough damage to see yourself through the game. And I guess double horn, double, or oh, sorry, quad belt means that you can spend all your tablets in one turn just dealing with one Arceus V-Star, and then you're just hunting the other ones for the remainder of the game. So maybe something like this is the real respect to Arceus that it deserves. Crazy, actually. I don't think I'd ever play four belts, but the statement is being made, and I think maybe three? <laughs> maybe three? Who knows? Uh, crazy. Then we have an Arc Intel. This is playing... Paths and Sharons and Judges, similar to uh, Pablo's list. I'm always doing these videos at the same time because my watch always goes off. <laughs> I still haven't found that thing. Uh, but yes, this is a pretty straightforward list. It's playing the Rod as well, so it seems like the Water Build Rod is superior to just playing Clara because you don't have any like attackers that you want to spring back. This is interestingly not playing Quick Shooting, it's just playing Big Shady. Um... So you can't do much setup damage. You're just sort of staying honest as a two and one prize attacking deck. Also, also not playing Raihan either, which is interesting. So low on these support accounts as well, but still playing that high ball search. I think uh, more and more people I'm seeing have higher ball search for the basics Arceus because they're just so important to get that energy drop on in the opening stages. Uh, we have another Mew. Let's see if there's anything else spicy going on. Back to the basics, really. More of what we'd expect. We're seeing a lot of Marnies coming in. I think that's really a knee-jerk to all these Moltres decks, which makes sense in my book. We have another Sylveon doing well. So this made top 8 at EUIC. <clears throat> and uh, this looks like an adaptation of that list. I don't think it's the exact same 60, is it? I think it's slightly different. Uh, but a very similar engine nonetheless. Maybe it is the same. No, it's not the same, because the EUIC list played uh, Peonia. And it played lots of 2-1 lines. This is basically just thickening the Sylveon, thickening the Urshifu. And I guess it plays less supporter cards? Something like that. Um, but yeah, uh, interesting take again. Sylveon hits a lot of good... Oh, sorry. The Sylveon deck hits a lot of key weaknesses. You've got Dream Gift to help you get towards Starbirth, which is really nice. You've got Tillery to give you coverage against uh, Path by being able to bounce via Rapid Strike Search, and it gives you some access to Karina to help out against Marnies and stuff. So I've actually played around with this at a tournament just the other day, and it wasn't too bad. I think you get some really ugly hands with the deck, but it represents really dangerous board states. So we're missing a couple of lists. We've got an Arc Beedrill, and we've also got an Arc Urshi. 
Uh, we've already seen the Arc Intel Beedrill. I'm not sure if this is an Intel list or if it's going to be um, a list using just like uh, Mu and possibly the Barrel or just like Crobat Luminion, that sort of stuff. Uh, we'll have to wait and see on that, but essentially we all know at this point that Arc is doing Arc things. Again, choosing to cut uh, Orochorio from these lists. I love to see it as a Mali player, but there you go. Uh, also playing a Peony, uh, which we haven't seen in a while, but it gives you access to specific cards, which is kind of cool here and there. Um, so yeah, uh, more Mew doing Mew things, basically. So that's the two lists we have on Limitless. Sorry, top eights that we have on Limitless. Let's quickly refresh just in case, because <laughs> I think Rob has been updating it uh, just recently. But no, we will use poker stats for the rest. So here is the... Uh, final standings uh, we have oops I am cutting off names here let's come on over here we have Alessandro Cremascoli who won with Whimsicott we have Tord we have Yuji Matteo Lucas Pedro Dario and James Cox the reason why I'm reading out these names now is I'm going to be jumping towards different Twitter handles and stuff and I'll probably lose some names along the way. We'll start off with Whimsicott. We don't have the guaranteed 60 just yet, but the good news for us is that Alessandro has a YouTube channel, uh, iCatopy. Go ahead and check them out. Uh, they are Italian native speaking, um, but this is the list they were testing five days before the tournament uh, on one of their streams. You can see I'm like late in the stream as well, because I think the list was changing, and I think they were trying different tweaks. Things that I know for certain was they did play at least one Shadow Rider Calyrex V. This allows you to establish a lock earlier on in the game for special energy if you really want to. It also acts as an attacking threat against uh, Rapid Strike Mali if you need it to as well, because it can do sprinkles of five counters. Uh, so something to bear in mind there. Um, but I think it's mostly in Alessandro's list to establish that lock early so that uh, yeah, you're basically always denying double turbo from Arceus. Because I think one thing about Whimsicott is sometimes it's vulnerable vulnerable against Arceus if like it's, its opening game crushing hammers just fail you. You basically can't do anything because they get to Trinity Nova and they just have a ton of energy around. Um, but I think uh, being able to establish Shadow Rider early can sometimes just deny Nova for the entire game, which I think is like massive. Uh, specifically in that matchup. And it can also slow down Mew as well, of course, just before you're ready to trick wind, really. Uh, so I think that could be a really big tech include. And they're also playing that high air balloon count to try and get into that Shadow Rider early. So it's clearly um, something that they valued a lot. And we saw on stream that they were trying to use the Shadow Rider uh, in spots in the early game. So definitely an element of their deck list, I think. Um, other than that, uh, it's playing Raihans instead of EXPs. I know Frank was like big on EXP share, so it's interesting that people are going away from that. Um, but there we are. It's got the Averys in there as well. So st similar draw engine really to Frank's uh, initial list, just adding in the Shadow Riders. Uh, it gives you extra odds of not leading Crobat, which is nice as well, <laughs> I guess. And you have great search for it, right, with all the ball search and the high fog crystal count. So even with that low energy count, you can get that turn one lock in place. So I imagine this is close to Alessandro 60, and I also imagine they'll be doing a video soon. So keep an eye out for iCatopy if you want to see the exact 60, but I imagine it's going to be close to that, and at least close to, to Frank 60, so yeah. Then we have in second place Tord. I mean, he's a machine. He's literally only lost to Whimsicott in... Uh, in this format, I think. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Uh, taking a few uh, tweaks to his list from EUIC, adding in Moltres V, and I can't remember if he played Hooper in EUIC, um, but regardless, that's in. Um, so yeah, just minor adjustments to the 60 that he played at EUIC and still doing incredibly well with it. What more can you say about Tord? He's just like a ridiculous, ridiculous player. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, and was unfortunately picked to the post again by Whims. I was hoping it was his redemption arc, um, because for me it felt like he had the best deck in the room for the EUIC, and it felt really sad that he went out in top eight. That's not a slight on anyone else, uh, but I am the biggest Tord fanboy, obviously. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, making it to finals as well. Like, the guy's just a machine. Like, he just, yeah, just crazy, and the deck list is still there. And still seems to be good enough, even though there are techs everywhere. I, I'm interested to hear his thoughts on the amount of Hooper V that he faced and how scared he is of that. Because I think the knee jerk was that people wanted to still play Arceus and then just add in Dark Package. And that's what we see in one of the top four places. I think this is just like an easy add in the format, right? You, you add the Hooper that helps against 
Urshifu, but then you still have the Dark Package here to help out against Mew anyway. This looks like it's playing Collapsed. It looks like, is that Piers, Marnie, Double Sharon's? Yeah, that seems to be the case. So it's, again, a pretty straightforward. We've seen a lot of these lists by now. This one's not playing um, Manaphy, which is interesting. And I believe um, it was this player who faced Tord in top four, off the top of my head. Um, so it's interesting that this one did falter. It feels like Manaphy, Dunsparce, and Hooper sort of need to be the package in order to get the job done. Uh, but there we go. In otherwise, it's just a pretty straightforward... Uh, Dark Arc Intel. Then we have... Actually, there's one more top eight list. I'm going to jump over to Paint because I've been busy rotating these things from individuals' Twitter. But this is Mateo's top four Mew list. And uh, it's pretty straightforward other than the fact that it's playing Towers. I know that's been a European thing that we've done a few times. So it's playing Towers and Pure Special Energy. So this would have been really bad against Beedrill. Something to keep an eye out for. But it means you're fast and consistent and have a lot of space to draw cards. So it's just like... The amount of space gained for Double Turbo is crazy. It's still insane for Mirror, obviously. And yeah, Tower, also good for Mirror while still respecting Path. Uh, so yeah, awesome to see the Towers doing pretty well. Um, but I, I do think it's a risk to not play any basic energy, especially with Whimsicott around. Uh, that's just my take. But yeah, really awesome result. Then in... Uh, more top eights. Let's get one more paint out of the way. We've got Pedro, who is playing a water-based build of Arc Intel as well. Looks like it's got the classic uh, supporting Pokemon. And it's got the Cheryl Raihan. It's got the very high path count, as well as double Sharon's Care. So people are still floating between the one and two count of Sharon's Care in this sort of deck to be defensive. It's got those two classic tools. It's really just got the the bunch of things. And yeah, the, the one ordinary rod seems to be just uh, standard across the board. I think the list we're seeing here has the fewest Ultra Balls that we've seen so far in the Arc Intels. Uh, so low odds to start that good old Arc V attachment, but uh, didn't seem to be a problem. Uh, made it all the way to top eight. Seems, seems good to me. Let's rattle off a couple more lists. We have a Dark Arc Intel. We've seen more and more of this. I think the double capture energy is kind of interesting. Uh, to give yourself slightly better early game. The downside is you're getting caught in the crossfire of fans against Whimsicott and the fact that they can get locked out of the game later. But in general, it's a slightly higher count of energy that you see in other arc builds. So cool to see that basic, basically trading off one of the double turbos, I guess. And it's playing maximum quick and ultra. This guy loves to start Arceus. You'll love to see that. Really, really skimpy on the support account, actually. Just double research, double boss. And one Sharon. So no hand disruption supporters at all. Crazy, actually. Really crazy. And just a 4-2 arc as well. And doesn't play Rod for any reload. Really interesting choices in this deck. But just saying that they wanted to have good turn ones. And Arceus with good turn one seems to be just like destroying everything. Because a good turn one means you get a good turn two. And then you carry through the game. So yeah, very different list. Uh, wild, actually. Then we have... Uh, we're getting there, guys. We're getting there. It's more Arc Intel, but it's just... There's different adaptations all over the place. And uh, this is actually, again, similar to Ian's 60, I guess, where it's got the Medicham and the Zapdos with the one fighting energy. So people are on a similar wavelength. It's got the quick shooting, obviously, and the Zig. And still has those important Dark Mons. It's actually uh, really similar to Ian's list. Crazy. When you think about it, uh, it's got the double e, su uh, e switch as well. So, uh, yeah, awesome to see two people from across the globe come up with very similar concepts and do similarly well in these events. So, yeah, this really is a very honest, similar take to uh, Ian's winning list. So, insane, actually. Uh, we'll end up on a Mew. This is a Heroes Medal Mew. And uh, again, playing all special energy. I would not advise all special energy with Whimsicott around so much. But there you go. Uh, they're only playing two stadiums as well, which makes me nervous. But uh, yeah, Heroes Medal. So the idea is that you only give up two prizes on your VMAX. It's not a bad idea, right? It means that this deck can race just more aggressively and can't get slowed down, basically. For these decks that are trying to just twiddle their thumbs until it's Moltres time to have big comeback plays, when they're only taking two prizes on these Mews, they're not going to make the comeback. So, Heroes Medal is actually something I need to try out. Um, 
it's annoying that it takes up so much space. Like double metal is obviously taking space of choice belts here, so it's not really consistency slots. Uh, but I would want to play psychic energy and courts in here, so I might have to trim down on the like chromatics, for example. The the triple rope over switch is like a preference choice. It's interesting that they still chose to play Marnie, even though they had Heroes Medal, so um, I'd like to hear the thoughts on that. Um, and in his own uh, tweet, he said that the, the medals weren't great for him in terms of the matchups that he hit, but it's good into Mira and it's good into Urshi. So um, I, I think he's still saying it's like a reasonable choice in the end. So that's cool to see that people are still innovating with me. And we've seen a lot of variation today with catchers with some good old straightforward lists we've seen high basic energy count as well in some of those catcher builds so uh people really are still finding the way to to do well with Mew. it's obviously still a good deck but yeah thanks to poker stats for that one i'm sure it will be on limitless soon as well so if you just want to copy and paste those lists into pcgo it'll be back soon but yeah lots of discussion today it's been a wave of arc and Mew doing well this weekend and Tord still flying the flag for urshifu and there doesn't seem to be much else room for innovation in the format uh we really didn't see much from any of the other decks trying to like get a look in feels like there's enough partners for arceus right now that it can perform well in various different ways we've got whimsicots that can do well we've got yeah not much else <laughs> that's really it. it seems to be it's like back to a two horse race we thought urshifu would make it a three horse race uh, but people came out in droves with their tech cards. And I still think people were scared to play Urshifu. Like, Tord stuck to his guns, but I know the American guys who all played uh, the deck in EUIC chose to jump back to Arceus. So maybe it's just a thing that the best players weren't playing the deck for this tournament. But uh, yeah, it seems that Mew and Arceus were really solidifying themselves this weekend and uh, both did almost equally well. So yeah, let me know your thoughts down below. What deck are you piloting? What's your favorite way to play Arceus right now? Do you go full toolbox? Do you go defensive but with dark? Do you go full water and boring? Uh, I'll hear it all down below and uh, let me know what's stronger, Arceus or Mew, because uh, the tides are changing. Cheers.